So how many people in this room were not in the previous presentation? Oh, OK, decent amount. OK. So um, the previous presentation was about how to build a REST JSON API. And we're going to, this presentation is about how to build a client that can talk to a REST JSON API. And we're going to touch on some things that were covered in the pre previous presentation. Um, so if I fly through something a little bit too quickly, uh, just let me know so I can cover it. So uh, my name is Les Hazelwood, Apache Shiro Project Chair and CTO StormPath co-founder. Um, we do identity management, cloud hosted, and our core product is a REST JSON API. And so everything I'm talking about in this presentation are all the techniques and tools and design approaches that we used in building our own SDKs that we distribute Apache license to all of our customers. Excuse me, so all of our APIs, um, excuse me, all of our SDKs are Apache licensed and they all kind of wrap the API <clears throat> and they all use the same design principles. So we have it for PHP and Node.js and of course Java and, and other languages, Ruby, Python. Um, and they all use the same exact design principles. Of course, their implementations are slightly different due to language differences, but um, this is the stuff we're gonna talk about. Representing resources, <clears throat> public and uh, the differences between a public and private API, um, some, some design discussions, configuration caching. Um, we'll get through hopefully all of these. Um, I, I just want to, for those that weren't here in the previous presentation, I want to touch on the acronym HADIOS. It stands for Hypermedia as the Engine of Application State. And this, this is kind of a mouthful that means um, a, a well-designed RESTful API <clears throat> Um, should be able to have clients that know nothing about it, discover everything they need to know, and then traverse a content graph or a resource graph based on links in the, in the resource representations. Um, unfortunately for SDKs, especially a type safe SDK, we're gonna break a lot of Hadios kind of ideals in this case. Um, type safe languages want account objects. They want with well-defined, well-known properties that you can compile against. So, a Hadios client is more dynamic, right? It says, give me the index document, and for each link, I'm gonna pull in these other documents. So it's officially getting maps of maps of maps of maps, right? Or dictionaries or hashes or whatever you wanna call them. That's clearly dynamic in nature. So if you wanna have type safety around that, you have to predefine or, or know about ahead of time um, concrete properties, which kind of breaks the Hadios convention. <clears throat> so uh, again, REST is all about resource representation or transferring the resource state representations between clients and servers. And I'll, I'll touch on briefly what I mean by this. A resource is a noun, it's not a verb. So things like an account or a directory or a group or a baseball team or, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. It's a, it's a noun, not a verb. And these nouns and their, their representation should be coarse grained. They should contain all of their properties. And when you execute a get against a resource, you wanna get back everything because you don't know what your client necessarily is gonna do with those, those attributes. Maybe they only need one, maybe they need five, you don't know. So the more coarse grained your resource representation is, the more use cases you can support for your customers. So we wanna keep these things as coarse grained as possible in order to support many different use cases, many of which you probably couldn't envision yourselves. Um, the really important thing about resources is that they all have their own globally unique href. Every resource that's accessible via client should have a unique canonical href location so you can query for it or interact with it. <clears throat> so this is what I mean by uh, resources. So there's kind of two resources. There's a collection resource, which contains other things, and then there's an instance resource. Um, and a collection resource in this example, if you interact with the slash applications URI, the, the, uh, the, the the implication is that you're going to be interacting with an actual resource with its own properties, offset property, limit property, maybe an items array that contains other resources. Um, and that's the idea of a collection resource. <clears throat> it's used as a mechanism to interact with multiple things. An instance resource, um, conversely, only interacts with one thing. So here's an example of interacting with one particular application, uh, slash application, slash ID. It's a child of a collection. It's not, um, it doesn't exist on its own. So it's in the namespace, if you will, of some parent collection. Um, and instance resources, in this case, when you interact with them, you can only do the, the RUD part of CRUD. You can't create a resource 
um, unless you're using put by interacting with an, exi with an, an existing URI. So we're not going to really get into the semantics of put versus post in this presentation, but in most cases, you would only ever perform the read, update, or delete operations when interacting with this URL. Uh, and then you would create against the parent collection. <clears throat> so how do we translate these concepts to code? Um, again, th this, this, uh, this presentation is largely based on Stormpath's own SDKs, and we try to come up with a general purpose kind of client framework first before we started you know, codifying our own domain specific model objects. So we're gonna cover kind of these, these foundations first before you see examples of concrete references or concrete implementations. So we actually represent this in our Java SDK as a resource <coughs> that has an href. Oh, how many people here do not program with a type safe language? Or when they're gonna build their client, they might use something that's not a, a type safe language. Okay, we got a couple people. So just note here that like all of these principles still apply. Of course, there's not gonna be an interface like for Python or Ruby because they don't support them. But whenever you interact with a resource object, it'll always have an href property that you can, inter that you can, that you can uh, interact with. So uh, if you're not using a type safe language that supports interfaces, just assume that these properties exist via duct typing on whatever object you're interacting with. So this is a claim that all resources have a canonical href. And that's true, especially in Stormpath's API. Every single resource has its own href. And the, the notion of an instance resource kind of extends this notion of a resource. So it extends a resource, um, and it's got its own properties. I've used via the, uh, the ellipses here, you know, maybe like get name or description. But the point is that it is itself a resource, and we also implement this uh, savable and deletable interface that we have defined. Um, savable implements just save. Deletable implements delete. And as you can probably infer from these interfaces, we're kind of supporting the active record design pattern here for instances. How many people do not know what active record is? Okay, so active record is a design pattern where you can perform CRUD operations by interacting with that resource directly. You don't have to interact with some data store or connection pool or whatever. When I call save, it's gonna be persisted to the data store automatically. When I call delete, it'll be pers or removed from the data store automatically. The caller of these two methods doesn't need to know anything about the underlying persistence technologies or tiers. So I'm not claiming the active record is the best thing ever, but for most clients using this stuff, it's really intuitive, uh, especially for people that might not understand um, more complicated techniques. And so this, team, this seems to be a pretty well-designed um, well pattern for people of all skill levels. And so we're supporting the active record design pattern on all of our resources. And we'll, we'll talk about how this actually works under the hood in a little bit. <coughs> so. In addition to instance resources, the things we do have our own collection resource interface. And really a collection resource just contains other resources. That's the generic type parameter that says a collection resource can be type scoped to a particular resource type. And it itself is its own resource, that's why it extends to resource, and it's also iterable. So as you might you know, assume, collections can have many things. So if I want to iterate over all elements in that collection, I can just you know, iterate via a for loop, for example, because that's built into the Java API. So if it implements iterable, I can iterate over all elements in that collection. The offset and the limit are pagination mechanisms. So when I get a collection, I might start it at some point beyond the first element in the collection. When I, when I query it from the server, I can also get a limit, meaning when I pull back this collection from the server, only give me a maximum of 100 elements, and then I'll, I'll call the server for the next page for the next 100 or what have you. So collection resources are, again, their own resources with their own properties, um, but they are, they are first class resources like others. And then if you wanted to, you could actually <coughs> have marker interfaces that you know, tie down the particular resource type that's gonna be used. So, if you wanted to have an application list, all it is is a collection resource that's you know, tied to an application instances. Any questions about translating RESTful API endpoints into Java types before we talk about implementation? 
Okay, good. Uh, again, no matter what your programming language is, just assume that these properties exist on these types. Okay, so that, that's kind of the, the foundation about how we're going to interact with, or rather represent RESTful concepts in a type safe way. Um, how do we design our framework? How do we design an SDK uh, to be usable by customers but allow us to develop against um, or implement for our own API? And so the first thing that we were kind of looking at when, uh, when we started you know, implementing this, this, the code base for our SDKs was encapsulation. We wanted a public API that customers can compile against, they can look at, they can read the documentation for, but we didn't want anyone to use any internal or private implementations at all. Like the private implementations or the, the internal implementations of the public API, we wanted to be able to change at will without breaking customer code at, at all. Um, but we also wanted to provide this notion of extensions so we could have kind of like plugins that are added to an SDK that provide additional functionality or maybe augment functionality. So these are kind of the three things that we w really wanted to <clears throat> enforce from a, from a programming standpoint. And the public versus private thing really helps with semantic versioning, allowing us to change things in the implementation without breaking clients. Are you guys familiar with semver.org? semanticversioning.org. So um, the, the first incarnation of this that I was ever introduced to was the Apache Portable Runtime, APR for the web server. Right? APR has this really great versioning guidelines on, on the website of how they increment minor and point reversions to guarantee backwards compatibility or not. Um, but it's very clearly defined and it's very rigorous. And so we want to maintain semantic versioning for all of our code bases as well because we don't want to break code for clients that are already integrated with previous versions. <clears throat> so we wanted to help with semantic versioning. We also wanted an internal and, and a public API. This is how we actually did this in practice. So this is kind of like an example of a Maven project. It, it doesn't have to be Maven, of course. It could be Gradle or Ant or whatever your build system is. But the idea is that we separated our code base into three separate root level modules. We have an API uh, module that builds a jar. We have an implement, implementation module. Actually, all three of these build jars. Oh, I spelled that wrong. Extensions <coughs> is actually, I actually misrepresented this. Extensions is a module that has its own modules. And by that, we could have called this plugins. So maybe, uh, for example, there's an HTTP client plugin that uses the Commons HTTP client library that is a third party library that might provide better request support than what's built into Java by default. So. We wanted to clearly separate the code base <clears throat> to let customers know um, what they can interact with and what they can compile against. So in our documentation, at least, they will depend on, they will have a compile time dependency on the API jar. And they'll have a runtime only dependency on the implementation jar. And the beautiful thing about that is, is that is, for us as a project team is that we have the freedom to change anything in the implementation jar we want at any point in time because we've declared it as off limits for our customers. So we don't have to maintain backwards compatibility there. We can change our code however way that we want. The only place that we maintain semantic versioning is in the extensions, submodules, and the API module. And that provides a really stable kind of API definition for our customers so that they, they know how to interact with our service. So what goes in the public API? <clears throat> for us, and we found this to be really beneficial, especially um, for mitigating change. Everything in the public API are all interfaces. There's, with the exception of helper classes with static methods that I'll show you guys in a little bit, everything is an interface. There are no implementations of what, what, whatsoever exposed to customers. Um, with the exception of helper classes, but they're declared as abstract, you can't instantiate them. Um, we also use builder interfaces quite a bit for configuration. So when you instantiate an SDK client, Maybe you want to customize the caching manager or what request mechanism is used. There's all sorts of customizations, caching TTLs, what have you. This is all done via builder interfaces. They don't actually ever get uh, instantiate their own instance of these interfaces. So we have no implementations whatsoever exposed to the customer. So that allows us to change these things whenever we need to. Really important, especially before you release 1.0. So if you're on the 0.x kind of timeline of your SDK or your client library, um, minimizing change is really nice if you can. So here's some example interfaces in our SDK. We'll have a client, client builder, 
application directory account group. Um, these are all Java interfaces um, or definitions of behavior if you're not using Java. Again, the one, the one exception we have here are these helper classes. And so you'll see here in bold, clients, it's actually, it kind of uses the kind of a fluent API design that you might see in other locations. Java actually has this in there. They have a collections class. You can do collections dot unmodifiable collection or unmodifiable map. This is a, a very convenient pattern that allows you to instantiate a new builder, which is itself, itself an interface. And then you can append things to the builder, you can modify, the, you can add an API key, you can do whatever you want, and then you call build, and you get back this client instance. And the client instance is everything the customer needs, or at least the starting point of everything that they'll, they'll be able to do with the, with the application, the API rather. So the, the idea here is that they are still not exposed to any implementation classes at all. Um, and you want to create separate helper classes to keep your separation concerns. Have you guys heard of the SOLID acronym, S-O-L-I-D? Right? Single responsibility principle, you don't want to incorporate too much functionality across concerns in a single class. So I might have a clients class. I might have an API keys class that only works with creating API keys. Uh, here's an example. Yeah. So, build, so uh, as I understand, you put a builder into a collection uh, class here. Huh? No, clients is just an abstract class. You can't instantiate it, and it's got a static method on it called builder. Okay, so it's not a collection class. Uh, it's not a collection class. Okay, good. Hmm. So the clients, this is the starting point of how we're going to instantiate our client instance. And this has nothing to do with our resources that we talked about earlier. Right? This is just getting a client that we can then use to interact with resources later. And so I, here, I'll give you a better example. Um, in StormPath, in order to communicate with StormPath, you have to have an API key. By default, that API key is a properties file that is stored in your home directory as API key.properties. And so as you see here, we're using two helper classes with builders. Clients.builder set API key. Then we're going to build an API key. We actually build the API key based on the file location. And then we build the client based on this information. So the idea is that via kind of a fluent API, we're starting to chain our configuration via builders. At no point in this entire process does the, the customer who's calling this code reference any implementation class at all. Does this make sense? Yes. So clients contain anything else besides the builder? Clients can, does clients contain anything else other than the builder? Um, it depends on your API, but in our case, it does not. Um, there's no reason to expose anything else other than the, a builder for creating your own client. So if I call clients.builder, I get a client builder back, which is, again, an interface. API keys.builder gives me back an API key builder, which is also an interface. So this makes it very, very easy via normal setter methods to construct object graphs via this chaining mechanism. Very convenient in code. It's, it's, it provides a nice fluent API. So if you have an IDE that does auto completion as you're typing these statements, you're you know, you're given options as to what else you can add to the configuration. It's very good for, for Java-based config. And because these are also setters, they can be used for bean-based reflection as well. So it satisfies multiple configuration use cases. So again, all of this creates instances of, an in, of interfaces, um, which means, uh, you know, how, do, how does our back-end API work? So if, I, if the cl customer's only, or client is only being exposed to these interfaces, we clearly need some implementations to support them. Um, and so the, the, the private API, the things that, that we're allowed to change ad hoc, contains implementations for these interfaces, plus maybe some other kind of interfaces for kind of service provider level functionality if you want to change functionality. Uh, some other, the actual implementations of those builder interfaces plus the, some plugins, like I said, the HTTP client plugin. <clears throat> and so the implementation strategy for this, and I'll go into this in depth in a little bit, but every resource kind of extends from this base or this abstract resource class. Um, this abstract resource knows how to manipulate with a map that comes back from the server. Right? JSON is just a, a set of name value pairs, a map or a dictionary. So it knows how to interact with that map. It can do some dirty checking. It has an internal reference to a data store that we'll talk about in a little bit in the architecture. 
Um, it can do lazy loading. So as you guys saw before, we saw links to resources. So if I have an account and I want to get its directory, I can do account.get directory and it can lazy load that directory because it knows how to interpret links. Um, so the directory doesn't have to be present for it to be loaded. Um, and then there's some kind of concurrency control stuff that we have built into this. All of this, by the way, all of our stuff is available on GitHub under the Apache license. So if you guys want to see real working implementation of this and find out how we do some of these techniques, it's all available to be used um, and perused at, at your leisure. <clears throat> so from the abstract resource class, we have an abstract, or abstract instance resource and a collection resource implementations that everything subclasses from from there. Um, let's see what this looks like. Here is an example of the default implementation of the account resource. Um, the naming convention we have at Stormpath is that if we can't <coughs> think of a name, it's, it's the default implementation so that it becomes default whatever the, the account, the interface name is. So we have a default account that extends instance resource that implements the account interface. <coughs> and the account interface has various number of methods. There's probably many more than this, but here's an example of what the implementation looks like. If I want to get the name of an account, I'm really going to interact with a map under the hood and get the name value under this key of name. So the key is name. Whatever value is returned is going to be a string, and we return that. And you can also do the same thing. We're setting a property, name, name. And again, these things are just, this is, in effect, a very lightweight proxy. Not an AOP proxy, but it's a proxy that just delegates operations to a wrapped map. And again, that map is the name value pairs that come back from the server via JSON. So this is one technique that has a lot of benefits, especially for dirty checking and for other things, over, say, like using JAXRS or telling Jackson to ignore unknown properties. So like, for example, we could have ignored this approach and just annotated a bunch of type safe attributes. And Jackson, if it found something we didn't understand, would by default throw an exception. But we could tell Jackson, hey, just ignore any, any attributes that I'm unaware of. And that would have been a fine approach, but it doesn't allow us to intercept a lot of these getters and setters and maybe do lazy loading of data or mark attributes as dirty. There's other intrinsic benefits of wrapping a map than just using raw type safe attributes. So that's the approach that we went with. It's actually worked out very well for us. Um, I encourage you to look at the implementation and kind of make up your own minds to see if that would be useful for you as well. <clears throat> so if this is the implementation, what is the usage pattern? How, how can this help the customer or the client making these calls? So account, if I get an account JSON resource back from the server, right, it's got an href, given name, surname, and then I've got this directory that points to uh, its owning parent directory. Right? I, I, I mentioned this earlier, but I'll say it again. In Stormpath, a directory is just a big bucket for account and groups, accounts and groups. And so every account is owned by a directory. Every group is owned by a directory. So if I have an account resource and I want to get its parent directory, I want to get all of its properties, how do I do that? Well, with this proxy approach, or without the proxy approach, you can kind of come up with this initial naive design. So I have a URL. Maybe I can call client.get resource patch in the href. It gives me back a map. And then from that map, I can find the directory link. Oh. Let's see. So I can find the directory link, you know, which is its own map with a single property called href. Then I can get it. Then I can interact with the client again to get this resource. And this will have all the directories name value pairs. I say this is a naive design approach for type safe languages because in, an, in dynamic languages, this actually works quite well. Right? You can interact with maps as if they're normal objects. So Python, Groovy, Ruby, nothing wrong with this approach um, there. But for a type safe language, this results in a huge amount of boilerplate code everywhere in your software. You know, you're constantly interacting with maps, you're casting things, it's extraordinarily difficult to deal with. So for a type safe language, this is not good. We need to find another way. <clears throat> so we stick with this proxy pattern. As you saw before, our objects are very, very lightweight proxies that wrap a map. And this allows us to do these kind of cool things. So maybe I can tell the client, hey, give me the account from this href, and it returns this object. Notice here that these are all interfaces, by the way. Right? Accounts and interface, directories and interface. The client doesn't see the underlying proxy implementation under the hood. But once I have an account, I can just do account.getDirectory. And now I get it back. 
and then maybe I can print the name. Right? This is way nicer than interacting with a whole bunch of maps, um, at least, again, for a type-safe language. <clears throat> and the, the idea here is that lazy loading and things like that could have been happening under the hood. So maybe if I call get directory, it just returns a proxy that has not been initialized yet. Because you guys are familiar with JPA and Hibernate and things like that. Same exact concept, right? I get back an, init an initial proxy that maybe has no data, but the second I call get name, maybe then it actually goes out and calls the server on my behalf or more likely interacts with a cache, which we'll talk about soon. And if it's there, it just returns it as an, as an object or it initializes the properties under the hood and then makes it immediately available via the get name property. So there's all sorts of really great things that we can do under the hood to make this fast and efficient and a much cleaner API for the customer to call instead of, I mean, look, look at that. And then look at that. Right? It, it, it's a no-brainer for TypeSafe if you're using a TypeSafe language. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, this is, this, these are effectively uber lightweight proxies. And this is, this is how that works. So if I call account.get directory, um, this is taken off of our, uh, of our product guide. So excuse the storm path references. But when I call this, that proxy actually calls something in the SDK to create a new REST request. Then it executes the request, it's a GET, hits the API server. Um, step five, you know, the response comes back, 200, okay, here's a bunch of properties. Reads the response, converts it into a map, and then makes that, a, and then wraps it in its own directory proxy, and then returns that to the caller. So all of this is kind of going on under the hood without the client having to worry about any of this stuff. Any questions about this so far? Nope, okay. So, it's very similar to what Hibernate does, but if you look at the implementation, it's way, way simpler than Hibernate. Hibernate does a lot more crazy stuff um, that we don't have to worry about. So let's talk about how, this is a high level overview of how this stuff works. <clears throat> uh, let's, I'm gonna drill, drill into this, this Stormpath SDK top blue box to show you all the components involved there. So this is the, this is the design of the framework. So there's a component architecture so if I call account.save, what happens? Remember, an account's just a proxy, and it's gonna delegate to an internal data store. And the data store is sort of like the, the main manager component for the whole SDK. It is the, the middleman between all of the SDK callers and the REST API server. Um, and we went with this approach because it allows you to do a lot of really cool things. You can manipulate the data store, you can plug things in, you can add in new functionality via layers, all without ever needing to impact the API callers. So for example, the data store has this thing called a map marshaller, which knows how to translate you know, JSON name value pair strings into object maps. And this is, this is really out of the box, a JSON, or excuse me, a Jackson implementation. So we just use Jackson to take the, the full string body and convert it to a map, very simple. Um, we have another component called a resource factory that takes that map and spits out an actual resource instance. So you know the default account implementation or default directory or whatever. Those, are, those implementations are instantiated with the map data and then returned by the resource factory. <clears throat> There's also a cache manager that the data store has direct access to. So it can check the cache first via URL, URI, before it has to go hit the server. This is really, really, really important for customers, especially if you do lazy loading or interaction of object graphs. So if I call account.getdirectory.getgroups.iterate.group.getaccount, right? Like it's constantly navigating over a potentially a pretty large object graph. So you're gonna want a cache manager in place to make sure that it's not hammering the server if it doesn't have to. Uh, this is both good for the client and the server. The server sees a reduced load. The client sees almost no latency, <clears throat> which is always nice. All of these things are then used um, by the data store. And then finally, if, if, it, if there's a cache miss, the data store interacts with a request executor. And this is the thing that executes the raw HTTP request, or handles the raw HTTP request response objects. Um, I do want to point out that there, We've, we've introduced this notion of an authentication strategy that a customer can configure via the builder, the client builder. They can specify an authentication strategy. Um, so HTTP or basic authentication, 
or digest authentication, the client can choose the authentication mechanism at once. Um, <clears throat> and then based on the strategy chosen, a particular request authenticator implementation is used. So you'll see a basic request authenticator, a kind of OAuth request authenticator, based on the authentication strategy chosen. The authentication strategy is just an enum to, to uh, enumerate the supported authentication mechanisms. And finally, the request executor will hit the API server. Um, and then you'll, it'll get a response back and the flow reverses, right? The request executor gets the body. It will interact with the map marshaller, convert it to a map. The map is converted to a resource. And then the resource, oh, it, and then the information is cached. And then the information, and then it's, uh, that instance is then returned to the caller. <clears throat> Any questions about this design approach? Nope. So we really, we're really, really happy with it. Um, all of our other language, our SDKs have the exact same architecture. So they all have instances of these objects, even though you know, Ruby doesn't have interfaces, what have you. They all support the same kind of um, implementation methods. Our Node SDK, which I thought was kind of cool, does not have one of these. Doesn't need it, right? Node natively supports JSON. So that was actually kind of a nice thing. Okay, let's talk about caching. Um, this is a very, very simple cache manager kind of API or definition. And under the hood, we actually delegate to real caching products. So like the Java SDK has, has a Hazelcast integration or Terracotta coherence or gigaspaces or, or whatever, it doesn't matter. This is just a very, very thin weight wrapper around a real caching infrastructure, memcache, doesn't matter. And a cache is nothing more really than, than a, um, a map with a couple other cache specific things. So it supports get and put and you know, remove and contains you know, all the map methods that you're probably used to seeing with, with Java. But it has some other um, cache specific things that you can, you can kind of introspect, introspect or set values on. Um, and the cache is basically a region name. <clears throat> so this is how, uh, in a much simplified version, how the data store kind of interacts with this stuff. So if I'm going to make a call to the client to get a particular account by href, this is what goes on under the hood. The client will delegate to the, the data store, as we saw in the previous diagram. But it first checks the cache manager. It says, OK, I'm going to get a cache object from the account region. I want to get the cache object that represents the account re account's region. And I'm going to see if that cache has the, the raw properties, the raw map that comes back from the server. Um, <clears throat> right here. And so if the account properties is not null, meaning it was cached, I'm just going to go ahead and create this instance. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and create this instance um, of this type using these properties. And this is going to return, obviously, uh, one of those lightweight proxy implementations. But if it's not found in the cache, then I'm going to go ahead and actually call the request executor to go ahead and execute that request to the backend server. So this, is, again, is a simplified version of what's actually going on under the hood. The most important part about all of this, though, is that the client doesn't know about any of this stuff. So for example, when we rolled out version 0 0.1 of the, of the SDK, we didn't have caching support at all. But by having this data store concept that handles all the meat and potatoes of what's really going on, we easily added a cache manager a little bit later to support caching, and none of our clients needed to change. Everything just worked. So the, the real benefit of this design approach is the notion of a data store that can be manipulated over time um, and provide additional benefits. I don't know, maybe you want to do logging or tracing, you know, see how long requests take to the server. You can do all that stuff at the data store implementation level without impacting customers. <clears throat> Um, I will briefly cover queries. You know, how do I execute queries? If, I, if I'm just working with this object graph, um, for example, maybe I want to get all the groups assigned to a particular account. This is going to, of course, interact with that account's specific collection of groups, which is represented in the API. But what about per query parameters? Like collections support pagination and searching and things like that. How do I make this nice and type safe? So we recommend using a Fluent API. Again, this is in the same spirit of the helper classes that we saw earlier. <clears throat> but a Fluent API, it makes it very easy to read. 
very simple to understand and to interact with. And again, you get IDE completion, auto completion, all these are really nice benefits. <clears throat> and so here's one of these helper classes, right, groups. <coughs> and this, this where method just returns a, a, a builder, a query builder, um, which is, of course, an interface. And so <coughs> I am going to get all accounts where the name starts with foo and the description contains the word test. Um, and then I want to order by the name descending, and I'm going limit, to limit to 100 results. Right, this is super easy to understand. It's, it's totally type safe. Um, we won't have time to go into the implementation details of how I do this, but it's, again, mostly just builders. So dot name returns a property builder that has a method called starts with or ends with. And based on the type of the, type of the field, name or description, um, the builder can change. So this gives the caller a lot of flexibility um, and ease of use uh, in type safe languages so that they can compose queries in a very nice way. Um, and it doesn't have to be like search queries, it could be anything. Like maybe I, all I wanted to do is just limit to 100. That would have been fine too. And so that, uh, that request results in the following, right? This is the translation. Everything after the query parameter. Th th these uh, query parameters and search syntax are Stormpath specific search syntax. So don't really worry about them, but you kind of see what's going on. This is, a, in essence, really just building query parameters, a query parameter map that is then um, encoded, URL and URI encoded before it's sent off to the server. So this is much nicer for type safe developers than that is. So we definitely recommend you kind of support that capability if you can. That being said, for dynamic languages like Groovy, that's a whole lot of extra kind of verbosity that they may or may not care about. So in addition to the above kind of builder approach. We also support the same methods, you know, that are um, overridden to accept a map object that you can construct in line. So name, foo, description, test, order by, name, descending, limit, right? These name value pairs adhere to our REST API specification. But this is clearly less verbose, maybe more desirable for people with dynamic languages. So it results in the same exact query. So we support both options because we have customers who use our Java SDK in Groovy and in JRuby and, and things like that. So they, they like this approach. <clears throat> Authentication, how do you do that? Um, I definitely recommend when you guys support this stuff or when you build an, a client, favor a digest algorithm over HTTP basic. HTTP basic isn't that secure. Even if you use SSL, there's all sorts of silly mistakes that people do all the time, like logging the base64 name value or uh, username and password to log files happens all the time. Servers won't do this by default, like Apache and stuff, they, they won't do that, but people, humans, do this all the time in their code base, which is totally insecure. Um, so if you can avoid basic authentication, that'd be great. Um, favorite digest algorithm. By digest, I mean OAuth 1.0a. Do you guys know how digest algorithms work for request authentication? Yes, no, okay. So when you have a request, it's got a bunch of headers, right? HTTP requests, name value pair headers, and then it's got the body. <clears throat> a digest algorithm computes a hash, like an MD5 or a SHA, SHA, SHA2 or SHA1, and that hash output is called a digest, right? So when I see the hex encoded value or whatever, or the base64 encoded value, that's called the digest, the, the output of that whole hashing operation. With digest-based authentication, the client performs a hash with a bunch of the headers and, the, and maybe the body, and takes that digest and it sticks it in the authorization header, and that's the whole request is sent over to the server, and the server ignores the authorization header and then computes the exact same hash on its side with all the header name value pairs plus potentially the body. If the server's hash output is identical to what was sent in the request, then it considers the request authenticated. Well, hopefully you're using a password-based hash like a MAC or an HMAC. And so the server considers that authenticated because the only other person or client that should have been able to create that digest would have been the client that has access to that private key. And so by comparing two digests, the huge benefit there is that no password is sent at all across the wire. It's just the digest output. So that's very, very secure compared to 
HTTP basic, which does encode the raw password into the header. And by using a digest algorithm, you prevent man-in-the-middle attacks. <clears throat> right? If any intercepting proxy or network piece of infrastructure, whatever, takes that information and they change any of the header values, then when the server calculates the digest, it's going to reject the request because it says, hey, what I calculated is different because somebody must have manipulated this in transit. SSL will not guarantee man-in-the-middle pre prevention. Most people think it does. Like if I just use HTTPS and then, or excuse me, if I use BASIC and I wrap it with HTTPS, I'm safe. Um, a lot of times it will keep you safe, but there are specific times where it won't. So one of the things to remember is TLS or SSL is a network level protocol. It does not secure or prevent manipulation or tampering with anything after network transit or before network transit. So you could have proxy servers, you could have you know, application stack filters, who knows, that can potentially manipulate this data or see data after or before SSL. As an illustrating point of this, Google, on their Google App Engine, damn it Google, will manipulate the HTTP headers before they send it off to the server. And so when StormPass saw customers going on Google App Engine, they would be complaining, They're like, we can't, our authentication's failing and we have no idea why. And we checked our logs and our digest calculation was failing because Google manipulates the host headers and some other things. So our digest was failing. They're like, what are you doing? How, like, essentially, we were detecting Google as a man in the middle attacker because they were manipulating the request when they shouldn't have touched it to begin with. <clears throat> so that is why digest algorithms are better. I will say OAuth 1.0a is good, but it does not authenticate the body of the request. It will for form URL encoded parameters, but that's useless for JSON or XML. Right? So OAuth 1.0a will not do that for the body. OAuth 2 uses something called a bearer token, which doesn't authenticate anything. It just assumes that you, oh, if you have the bearer token and you're on SSL, I trust you. Like, as a security guy, I hate OAuth 2. OAuth 1.0a is way better because of these additional guarantees. For certain contexts like social stuff, it's probably not that big of a deal to have digest authentication. It's a big deal for like banking things though, banking applications, finance. Um, StormPath created our own digest authentication mechanism because we're crypto people. Um, and it and Amazon's are nearly identical, um, but we guarantee no tampering in the body either. So you can think of StormPath as OAuth 1.0a plus body authentication as well. And we need that because some of our customers are banks and government agencies and whatnot. But, um, so favor digest over HP Basic. That being said, it's probably good to create this authentication scheme enum to let your customer choose. So our Google customers, or those that are deployed on Google App Engine, have to choose the basic authentication because Google doesn't give them a choice. So if you support multiple authentication schemes, you can do that. So here's an example of how a customer might choose to do that. <coughs> SAuth C1 is StormPath's own digest authentication. This is all open source, by the way, peer reviewed in the crypto community. So you can see how we do this if you're curious um, by going to our website. But then, you know, there's basic OAuth 1.0a. So a client can then create their builder. They can set a different authentication scheme to basic, for example, if they can't use SAuth C1. And then they do build. And under the hood, the client will then choose particular request authenticator implementation based on this enum value. So this allows the customer to configure their authentication experience. <coughs> plugins. Um, plugins or extensions. We, we covered this briefly in the beginning of the presentation where we have a separate extensions directory and then under that we might have an HTTP client directory. So what this allows a customer to do is use the commons HTTP client with connection pooling and all sorts of goodies built into it as the mechanism that the, the SDK uses to transmit requests and read responses. As opposed to the java.net.url class, which does HTTP requests, but doesn't have any of this other stuff built in. So we advocate keeping all third-party integrations in their own separate isolated module. And then if you have other plugins, I don't know, maybe you want to allow customers, but there'll be like a Hazelcast plugin or a, Redis plugin, it doesn't matter. They can kind of use this stuff and then add it to their runtime configuration. <clears throat> and lessons learned. So almost everything I've been talking about so far is a result of a lot of lessons learned for us. Uh, 
things that we did wrong, and you're now seeing the output of what we believe is now right, given that our customers are much happier. But here's some other kind of things to note. Um, if you support resource expansion, like in the previous presentation, I talked about this expand parameter. If I wanted to get the account plus its directory, when you get that body back, it's going to be that plus a link plus anything else that it's linked to. You have to support recursive caching because each one of those resources needs to be cached independently of, of the whole request or the whole response. And so just keep that in mind. Um, we, we've gone through the effort to support that. It works perfectly well, but you know, does add a little bit of complexity. Dirty checking logic is not that difficult. So anytime that you set a property in one of our instances, like an account or directory, we keep track of the fact that it's, it's dirty so that when we send a request to the server, we only send the dirty properties. Right? And that way we're kind of minimizing the bandwidth that's used for every re outgoing request. That's not that difficult, but it does add a decent amount of complexity. Or not, not even a decent amount, just enough. So the recommendation there is just start off without it. Send the whole response, excuse me, the whole body over the wire um, and don't worry about it. <clears throat> and then you can add this stuff in later as time allows. Um, the biggest thing though that we have not done yet and I think one of the most important things that's going to affect us as a team moving forward and hopefully it affects you guys is async, 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 async. So huge recommendation. Our, our, uh, our SDK right now is fully synchronous because it's built on top of the Apache client, uh, HTTP client. But it's not very easily usable by anyone who's using Vertex or Netty or Scala or Clojure, like all these functional programming or asynchronous programming languages. So it's hard to use in these languages or these environments, it's hard to use synchronous APIs because they're built on top of this you know, event loop pattern and reduced um, or IO or at least event driven IO. So it's hard for them to use this stuff. <clears throat> so my recommendation is that if you're gonna start building this stuff from scratch, don't do what we did out of the box. We are moving to an async client. Start off with async. Netty has an, a fantastic async HTTP client that you guys can use as the basis for your request executor implementation and then make everything in your API async. But it's really easy once you have an async API to support synchronous API for those that want it. Really easy. So here's an example. So here is a proposed kind of request builder implementation where I want to get all accounts for a particular, or excuse me, all groups of a particular account. And if I do this like little dot req, I'm creating a request builder where blah, 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 dot execute, and I can have this result listener, which is effectively a promise that on success, I get the result back. On failure, I get the exception. And so all of this can be executed asynchronously in an event loop, and it can be used by all these async frameworks. Um, so this returns a builder, executes an async call with a promise, but it's still really, really easy to use to support a synchronous API as well. Like we can have our existing API of get groups to just delegate the internal implementation to this, or it just calls the dot get, which is a synchronous wait command essentially for callback interfaces. So the dot get will just wait until the result comes back before it, it, uh, it returns to the caller. So you can support both mechanisms very, very easily. Um, highly, highly recommend start with async now, and you'll support virtually all use cases, and then you can very easily add in the synchronous uh, logic after, at the end. So here's the code. If you guys want to check it out, go to our GitHub. You'll, you'll find this, all of the things that I talked about there in the implementations, um, all of the dirty checking and all sorts of caching stuff, and, uh, and you can build it yourselves very easily. I'm out of time. Thanks so much for attending. If you have any questions, I can answer for them. Anything? Either this or rest-based from the previous presentation? So say you have a layered system where you're, you're generating your, your resources on a, say something that doesn't really know JSON or isn't tied to the uh, web server that's um, directing it. How do you generate HREFs? Um, do you just generate uh, relative URL paths um, from that server product because it has no notion of what it's, um, you know, what server is, is, is deploying it? What do, you, or, what do you mean exactly? No. Well, for instance, you, you know, you have a data set. Yeah. And you want to provide hrefs to the individual oh, yeah, records in the that data, data set. Oh, yeah, the data set doesn't have that built in. Correct. Yeah, so 
That depends on your data set structure. You would have to generate hrefs, or excuse me, hrefs with unique IDs, for example, right. that correspond to that particular data set. Um, that's pretty easily done with like, you can either create like your own little wrapper, little REST API wrapper, or kind of data access wrapper around that data system to also return an href property in addition to the things that come from the raw data store. Right. And then that can be used to, by the URL generator to just generate that based on the ID that you've given. So I, I would do that as a, as a nice little wrapper API around the raw data store. And okay. then every time the request comes in with that ID, then you have to have some lookup mechanism that says for this ID, I want to pull this raw data set. Right. Usually it'd be some mapping table somewhere, or some distributed cache, for example. But that's pretty, pretty easy to do, I think. Okay. But I would definitely do that at the data tier so the rest of your application and the REST API doesn't have to worry about that stuff. Yes? So two-part question is, why didn't we favor immutability over the dirty checking and the immutable kind of capabilities? And if you did favor immutability, isn't that more aligned with the asynchronous approach, right? <clears throat> so the reason we didn't favor immutability up front was that we felt the vast majority of proxy slash data object use cases was people wanted to set the actual um, properties directly on the object without, and then have like a set of dirty set that they could send to the server. So it made more sense to a lot of our consumers. That being said, oh, I kind of, let, uh, let me show you something. I kind of snuck this in here, but this is, this is actually how we're going to start building the, um, the async API. And we're changing our, ha, see this API public account set name? Right, this is a setter. Most people use void for this, right? but we're actually returning the object. So today, this is still mutable and dirty, but it returns this so you can do method chaining, right, which is really nice. In our async version, this is actually going to return a new immutable copy of that object. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, in our current API today, by the way, this is still void. But our, uh, our, our 1.1 API is, actually, no, our 1.0 API is going to, switch to this approach, still be mutable, and then the async that comes after that will be, there'll be no API changes for the caller. Yeah. If it's, is it what? Yeah. So it's, so what we do is, for simplicity, I didn't really cover this stuff, but each class at the top has a, a list of static attributes that define what properties it knows about. And those properties are then referenced everywhere. So like I don't actually pass in raw strings. I pass in the name constant. That's true. That's true. If you have a lot of resources, it's probably a problem. We maybe have like 10 that we have to support. And so it's not, we haven't really seen many problems because we haven't done significant refactoring Oh, we also, I didn't mention any of this stuff, we have a huge exhaustive test suite that goes with all this stuff, so hopefully we'd catch that. Yeah, it, it won't work with bean validation. Um, well, that's not true. If you put the annotations on the public getters and setters, it would work, right? You can annotate methods as well as you could attributes. So that would work in that case. That being said, we don't actually do a lot of that validation client side um, because of the sheer labor it would cause our development team. So we support a Python, PHP, Ruby. Uh, I think we're coming out with Go pretty soon. Like we're, we have a lot of these SDKs. And for us to replicate that validation logic in every single one of these SDKs, it's a huge effort for, we're a small team, we're like 15 person company. And our core engineering staff is like seven, eight guys. And so to support that level of work is difficult. So we don't actually validate on the client side. We send it to the server and let the server validate it. So then it works the same for all clients. But as we get bigger as a company, I hope to dedicate an engineer per SDK where they would do that overhead just to make it a little bit nicer for the, for the client. 
Okay. Thanks for your time, guys. Thanks. <clears throat> oh, if you guys are curious about Shiro, I'll be talking about that this afternoon. Shiro security and session clustering. <clears throat>